Welcome, movie fans, to another episode of Hollow Victories, where the real fantasy is a movie worth watching. I'm joined, as always, by my mythical co-host. Hello, my name is Aragorn. I mean Aragon. <laughs> and uh, our special guest today, very good friend of mine, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, my name is Peyton. I am... I am a uh, friend of Matt's from back in the day and a uh, self-proclaimed Percy Jackson expert. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and today we have a, a very interesting matchup. Uh, I want to set the stage a little before we get into this because uh, back in you know the early 2000s, uh, the first Harry Potter movie comes out. And it's a big success. And and Lord of the Rings also comes out. Lord of the Rings is huge. And suddenly, we are just bombarded with a litany of YA fantasy adaptations. Um, and most of them are not good. There are actually a lot of movies I think we could have put into this matchup. Um, I, it, it is, of course... Percy Jackson and the Olympians, colon, the lightning thief. <laughs> that is the full title of the movie. I think I got it wrong last time. I just called it Percy Jackson and the lightning thief. They they could have settled on one of three names for sure. The, the book was just called The Lightning Thief. I get wanting to call it Percy Jackson and the lightning thief as sort of a setup for a franchise. But Percy Jackson and the Olympians, the lightning thief is entirely too much. <laughs> It's Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief versus Aragon. And I picked these two because I I remember these two being the big two books. Now, you also have stuff like uh, Golden Compass. And I, I don't remember Golden Compass ever being as popular as these two. Uh, uh, plus, like, Guardians of Gahul, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Owl movie. Uh, and, and <laughs> well, I mean... Disney's Sorcerer's Apprentice, although that's not based on a novel. And that's getting a little close to the end of this phase, I feel. Yeah, uh, plus you got, like, the Narnia movies, although those were generally well-received. I remember them being decent. Yeah. The Golden Compass, I only know about because I'm the Rich Alvarez lore master, and that they made fun of that, like, constantly on their channel. <laughs> so all I've heard about the Golden Compass has been... Very, very negative things. Yeah, but I, I don't know anyone who read The Golden Compass in, in like, well, in like middle school, which is when I remember these books being popular. Everyone was reading The Lightning Thief. Everyone was reading Aragon. Yeah, Aragon was really popular. My brother, I remember having the books around, and I'd go to school, and, like, that book, I, that book cover is ingrained in my memory because of how <laughs> often I saw it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good cover. Yeah. I mean, kind of tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> um, Peyton, would you like to introduce Percy Jackson and the Olympians, colon, the lightning thief? <laughs> sure. So, uh, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, colon, the lightning thief, uh, is a 2010 film directed by Chris Columbus uh, from 20th Century Fox. And in it, uh, we see... Uh, Percy Jackson, the title character, uh, starts as just a normal down-on-his-luck kid from New York, you know, who feels like, you know, isolated at school, His he's got a bad stepdad, his mom works too hard, and, you know, he's very down on his luck, and then that all changes whenever suddenly the world of Greek mythology becomes real for him, and he's whisked away to the mystical Camp Half-Blood where he learns that he is the son of Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea, and has to go on this daring quest to stop the gods from uh, going at war with each other. Because someone has stolen Zeus's master lightning bolt. And so all through the film, Percy, his friend Grover, who he finds out is a satyr, and uh, Annabeth Chase uh, go on a road trip across the United States that takes them from New York all the way to Los Angeles. And they have to collect a few things along the way and then dive down into the underworld in Hollywood to try and save the Zeus's master bolt. 
and a few twists come along along the way and they're uh, thrown for a loop uh, by a betrayal by a friend and all in the end they're able to get the master bolt and bring it back to Mount Olympus which is in this world actually at the top of the the uh, Empire State Building and so Percy brings back the lightning bolt and uh, lets the 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 uh, Olympians know that he was not the thief and uh, vindicates himself and saves the day. I can hear your cat. Yeah, sorry. My, <laughs> my cat's just now, after watching Aragon with us, completely still has decided to get the zoomies now while we're recording. <laughs> uh, had a good movie, now needs to get some exercise. Uh, Hayden, um, so I, wa- I wanted to... I wanted you to start this one off just in terms of how we feel about it, because when we had Mitzi and Olivia on as guests, it was kind of interesting because they were kind of there as defenders of what we were talking about. Like Olivia likes episode one of Star Wars. Mitzi loves the Care Bears and My Little Pony stuff. Uh, For you, though, it's like the exact opposite with Percy Jackson, isn't it? You're here to you're you're a strong hater of this movie, I believe. (laughs) (laughs) This movie, um, I've it's. I don't feel as badly about it as whenever I was a kid, but uh, I saw this movie on my birthday the year that it came out with my first ever girlfriend and that uh, the movie pretty much uh, ruined that date for me, ruined my first ever date (laughs) because I was a super fan of the books. This uh, film came out uh right before the last book in the original percy jackson series came out so if you were a percy jackson fan it's like the perfect hype time you know we we see our harry potter moment in the future like oh man the books that we love we're finally getting a movie about them the first series is about to wrap up the world is bright for percy jackson and then you go and see this movie And I was hung up on the fact that there are so many things changed between the book and the movie that if you were trying to start a franchise, actually hamper it a lot. And I was really, really hung up on that as a kid. But now as an an adult, I'm just kind of hung up on it because it's, well, not that good of a movie. (laughs) Are you mean to tell me that the Percy Jackson books did not have a high school musical reference in them? I mean, I will say they very well could have because it was a very, there were a lot of references in the books, but... Yeah, but uh, Lightning Thief came out before High School Musical, right? I believe so. High School Musical was like 2007, right? It, it, it's kind of like the, I, I get it though. It's like a reference. Like the characters do reference modern things for the time, I guess. So they high school musical isn't like unreasonable for the movie. Yeah, okay. High school musical was 2006 and lightning thief was 2005. Right. I did look that up earlier because uh, I was surprised at how late this movie came out. <laughs> this movie came out in 2010 and I'm like, you guys kind of missed the boat on young adult fantasy, didn't you? <laughs> like, Harry Potter was done by then, the whole... And, and like, everything else was had failed up to that point. It's making and, a comeback with Chaos Walking. <laughs> and, and, and Artemis Fowl. Don't forget Artemis Fowl. Oh, God. <laughs> See, it's, so, it's so obvious to me that they bought the rights to Artemis Fowl during, like the Harry Potter years and then couldn't get the movie off the ground <laughs> for like a decade. <laughs> that one missed the boat by a lot. But Percy Jackson was pretty late. Yeah, by the time Percy Jackson came along, we were what already into New Moon in the Twilight Saga and we were just about to enter like the Hunger Games era of young yeah. adult movies. Twilight and Hunger Games kind of put it into, like, the Harry Potter era. Mm-hmm. When one was... Hunger Games was 2012, so I assume the book was, like, 2010. Yeah, those books got made pretty quick after they were released, although Suzanne Collins had been writing stuff for a long time. If you remember the Gregor the Overlander series, oh, yeah, she the, the author that wrote the Hunger Games series actually wrote that series, too. So she'd been active for a bit, but Hunger Games was a later series. For- 
First Hunger Games book, 2008. Okay, cool. Where do we want to start with this one? <laughs> well, let's... I, I do want to... Peyton, we have you on, because obviously you are a big fan of the Percy Jackson books. Uh, so you know a lot about them. Also, I was kind of counting on you to know a little bit about the Aragon books. But there is one very specific thing, a uh, very specific connection to the Percy Jackson series you have uh, that I was wondering if you would like to talk about. Absolutely. So whenever I was in, uh, I guess it would have been... Uh, sophomore oh, year? Oh, goodness. Yeah, I guess that would have been sophomore year um, of high Almost school. Almost 10, year, 10 years ago? <laughs> it, Fuck, we're old. <laughs> we're getting old. <laughs> uh, but whenever I was in high school, I actually, uh, I'm, well, I'm a cancer survivor. I had a, a very, uh, very, in, in terms of what I could have gotten, very mild kind of cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I still went through that. And part of going through that, I actually got to be in touch with a wish granting uh, organization and my wish, the uh, nerd that I was, you know, not going to Disney World, not going to Hawaii, my wish was to have an interview with Rick Riordan, the author of the Percy Jackson books. Hell yeah. And so sophomore year, uh, I think it was actually the summer before sophomore year, I sat down with him and had a uh, Skype conversation with him. Uh, and interviewed him, asked him for tips on writing. I actually still have the notebook that I took all my notes in and had all my questions in. And it, it was a really, really sweet thing. He actually sent me a signed copy of the first book in the series he had just started at that time, the Cain Chronicles, which is his uh, Egyptian mythology series, and a signed copy of the Lightning Thief graphic novel. And those are those are like locked away in my sanctum sanctorum in my apartment because that's like my my inception totem right there. That's my core memory. <laughs> uh, did you ask him about the movie? Um, I I didn't <laughs> because <laughs> okay. famously. Uh, even even very quickly after the movie came out, uh, Rick Riordan distanced himself from the movie very quickly. And I think it was <laughs> either last year or two years ago, he actually published a lot of the emails that he sent back and forth with uh, 20th Century Fox execs. And they, they're they very strongly worded for a, a children's <laughs> author. <laughs> It's like oh god, now you gotta send me those. I want to. I'll, I'll find it, I'll find the tweets. They're on his Twitter. I'll I'll send those to you oh, later. Goodness, uh, I'll link in the description. <laughs> I'll link that in the description. Absolutely. If you, if you remember, you could put one up on uh, one up on the screen and edit in. <laughs> I probably uh, could. The uh, I was gonna say that's got to be frustrating. Because it's like, write, write a novel is obviously a big accomplishment on its own. You don't have to get a movie adaptation. But I have to imagine getting a film adaptation is exciting. Because now you have all these visuals to it. You have people acting out what you wrote. There's like music. It's like a big production. Um, so that's got to be a cool thing to get to experience if it's done properly. <laughs> Which so often it's not. Fucking, so often it's not done well. <laughs> and... That's just gotta suck when your characters are completely misinterpreted, which from what we talked about, the three main characters were greatly misinterpreted oh, man, in this man. movie. Yeah, no, I... Here's the thing, I, I read The Lightning Thief when I was in middle school, and I remember really liking that book, despite the fact that I never read any of the sequels. But my memory of these characters is very different from the way they are portrayed in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it... It suffers a lot from feeling like you have to sell... The movie feels like it really has to sell like your classic love interest, uh, love interest guy, love interest girl, and comedy relief character. And that is so far from how the characters really kind of play out in the series itself. You know, Percy's yeah. not really a stock... Uh, 
lead guy. Annabeth is definitely not a stock lead girl, and they make Grover like the. <laughs> I made the joke, you know, Grover fucks in this movie, and in the book yeah. series, Grover does not fuck. He's he's so horny, but I'm like, in the book, he was like a nerd. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> You, you kind of explained it in a way last night that I found interesting because you just kind of described like how each of them kind of had like a different personality trait, but together they kind of balanced each other out. Yeah. Uh, like where the girl was a lot more neurotic and like crazy in the book. Yeah, like we're introduced, we're introduced to Annabeth in the book. Uh, Percy Jackson wakes up after exhausting himself in a fight at the beginning of the book and uh, sees her literally staring at him in his sleep and she <laughs> she says something like you snore in your sleep or you 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 blow snot bubbles when you sleep or something like that that's our first introduction to the leading lady of the whole series whereas here in the movie <laughs> it's a very generic like he does the fight he passes out from exhaustion he wakes up and then his friend grover is there and introduces him to the fantasy elements of the world, you know, because now Grover's standing there with goat legs, and he's in yeah. the, you know, very Greek-style encampment of Camp Half-Blood, and Grover walks us through, like, seeing what the fantasy characters that uh, Percy knew on the outside in New York, seeing what they're like now here in Camp Half-Blood. So, like, in the... And the movie, because like you just described uh, a second ago, like her first interaction with him in the movie, it's like a very generic, I have strong feelings for you. I don't know if they're negative or positive, <laughs> you know, like that's what they do in the movie. And what you're describing is like significantly more interesting. <laughs> I haven't read the books, <laughs> full transparency, I haven't read either of these books, uh, but there's ideas in Percy Jackson that seem like they could be interesting. I, I believe that the books are good from what I'm hearing, but it just doesn't show in the movie. You're about to say something, Matt, sorry. Uh, not really. I, I, I was gonna, I was gonna reference Percy, Percy sees her, like, fighting mm -hmm. and asks who she is, and then his friend is like, ah, she'd squash you like a bug. <laughs> and it's like, you say that like it's a turnoff. <laughs> Grover, of all people, should like that. <laughs> And that's another interesting change they make from the books to the movie is we we have that moment and Annabeth is that kind of stereotypical badass who's been at the camp for a while. She's obviously like the top fighter. And so our new protagonist, our, our audience insert, sees the hot girl fighting and is like, I want to achieve that. I want to pursue, you know, whereas yeah. In the books, the, the character that we see as Annabeth in the movie is really a combination of these two girl characters. There's one who's a daughter of Ares, but she's like mean and grungy and like built like a brick shit house and hates Percy from the get go. And then Annabeth is more on the like, I'm weird, you're weird. We have an at least, you know, platonic connection here at first. And so in that, the first real action scene in Camp Half-Blood is a capture the flag scene. And in that, in the books, it's Percy, Grover, and Annabeth teaming up against Clarice's team, the, the Ares team. Whereas here in the movie, we see Percy versus Annabeth's team, kind of putting them against each other here in the movie, as opposed to having them team up in the books. Um, I think we should mention in the movie, uh, as following this, you know, capture the flag scene, they meet up with Luke, who is the son of Hermes. Yes. Um, and, you know, he, he gives them some stuff. He, he gives them like a flying pair of converse and, uh, a map to find, the pearls of Persephone that help you come back from the underworld. Because they're, they're trying to rescue Percy's mom from the underworld. Um, so they, they need these pearls of Persephone to, to get them back from the underworld. And it's pretty apparent in the movie that Luke is going to end up not being a good guy. <laughs> He's going to betray them at some point. 
Yeah. Like, my, Michael called it, like, an hour <laughs> before it happened. It's like, not Luke's the bad guy. So Luke, Luke is going to betray them. Yeah, he was way too polite. Like, it, it, it was, like, an excessive level. And then there's a scene right after they battle Uma Thurman where they're like, it would have been nice if he said something about her. And he says, well, maybe he just didn't know. And it's like, you de- that line didn't need to be in there. You're absolutely hinting at him being a villain there. Like, there's no other reason that they would have said that. And then, uh, should we, uh, I don't know if, we're ju- if I'm jumping to this too quickly. We should also mention that both of these movies have a returning actor. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the Aragon one, but we just mentioned Uma Thurman. She was in the yes, first yes. movie we uh, ever covered. This, this movie, weirdly, has a lot of star power. And granted, they they tend to show up for, like, a scene and then leave. Yeah. Um, and I think it is mostly good casting. Like, Uma Thurman plays Medusa, and I'm like, you know what? That's good casting. Really, it's just the main girl and main guy who were kind of bland. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, the main characters are all kind of... That, well, they're like teenage actors who yeah. who are just kind of like trying to get their foot in the door and they weren't very good. Yeah. Uh, they, they've, both of them have like gone on to other stuff. Uh, yeah. Logan Lerman as Percy Jackson uh, and Alexandra Daddario. I definitely have seen her and stuff. Uh, Annabelle, yeah, she's, uh... She just had a stint in the White Lotus, uh, miniseries that was on, like, Hulu, I think. I heard of that. She was in a It's Always Sunny episode. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, uh, she's been around. She's done some stuff. Grover, I actually think the actor did an alright job for what he was given. Mm -hmm. Like, you can say that it's not the character, so you can say the character is bad. But he, you know, he plays, he's, like, playful with it. He has, like, a personality. He he isn't bland like the other two. Right. He was he was in Bojack. He oh. Was, uh, cor- he was Corduroy in Bojack. Huh. Um, oh, wow. But even, even prior to this film, he was Al Pacino in Tropic Thunder. So, <laughs> like, he, he was somewhat established, at least. Yeah, but then uh, in the peripherals of this movie, you've got Kevin McKidd as Poseidon, Steve Coogan as Hades, Sean Bean as Zeus, uh, Pierce Brosnan, Rosario Dawson, Kathleen Keener is his mom, uh, yeah. and Joe Pantoliano is the the abusive stepfather. Um, so it's it's like big names in this movie, even though most of them are barely in it. Kathleen Keener's in a lot of it. She is a major character, but yeah, uh, most of the names are in like a scene, and that's it. Some of them are in like the last scene, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, yeah, the uh, I- I'll say this: uh, I, like, just you mentioned the abusive stepfather, and it kind of made me think about like the beginning of this movie. I-, I thought that the first hour of this movie, you you kind of mentioned it, Matt, when we were watching. Yeah, is it's pa- it's paced pretty well. Like it, mm-hmm. it's not it's not lagging on staying yeah. on things too long. It it gets right into it. Well, you're like 10, 15 minutes into the film and he's getting attacked by one of the Furies and you're like, oh, okay, we're already at this point. Okay, because a lot of films would drag their feet getting to that, but the, this movie's like, nope, right up at the top. Like, it was bad. I felt like it was bad in the first hour, but it was kind of like a Book of Henry bad where I like it was amusing, you know? Yeah. And then I think the second half, it slows down so much, and I was not enjoying it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It just um, comes to a complete... Like they're, and they're trying to be have fun with it. Like, the, the, the Vegas scene is kind of... <laughs> it's a little humorous. They're getting stoned off their asses and tripping. Oh, yeah. Like, I, liked the, I, I liked the Vegas scene well enough, but, like... This this movie is almost two hours. It's an hour fifty eight, and this did not need to be two hours. This could have been an hour forty five, maybe even an hour thirty, and not lost anything. It's once they get to the road trip, but the thing is, I felt like they had creative. I think every single stop in the road trip had a creative idea. It's just at that point, I needed to connect with the characters better. The first hour did an interesting job setting things up with just how chaotic it was. Uh, and then the second hour, it was just like, I need to know, I need to connect with these three kids that we're spending this much time with better. I need to understand, I need to have like a connection with them to continue to enjoy this movie. 
Uh, and I just, I didn't have it. Like, I think likable characters is a very important thing for a fantasy. I think that's why I dislike a lot of these types of movies, whether they're considered good or bad. It's just like, I think some of some, so many of them are trying to focus so much on the world that I don't get, I don't grow a connection with the characters in it, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I think especially how it comes across in this movie is it, like every time they go to a new location on the road trip, it's the same thing where they show up, they don't see that there's a monster there. The monster then appears after they wander around a little bit. The monster's like, give us the bolt. They're like, we don't have the bolt. They fight the monster. They kill the monster. They leave. And I think if they had like maybe one of those scenes and then we had like a good act to sit down, get to know the characters in there. And then we get to hell after that, we get to the underworld just like after one stop. I think that would have been a lot better, but I feel like they might've felt like the source material is very road trippy. There's even more stops along the way. And they're like, well, we got to put the monsters in. It's a Greek mythology movie. We got to put the monsters in. And so we don't, we like got a five minute hotel scene after they beat Medusa where they're hanging out and talking about stuff. And they literally have to run away from the hotel. That's how fast they're trying to get out of the, the sitting down and talking part. Yeah. yeah. That scene was not needed. And I'm all for a scene where you just have the characters kind of sit down and talk, but you can like, don't even make them change locations. Have them sit down and have the talk after like a battle or something, you know? Yeah. Um, probably worth noting that uh, Disney Plus is currently working on a Percy Jackson series. And hmm. I think that probably would work better, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Because, I mean, for one thing, you can make the book you know, many episodes and then, you know, there are many, many books in this series, so you could keep a TV show Percy Jackson going a lot longer, even than, than, than like, an attempted Percy Jackson franchise. They did make a sequel. They did make Sea of Monsters. <laughs> um, regrettably. <laughs> that, that one is a little bit more faithful to the book, but with what they had already established in the first movie, it just was untenable. Did not have the same budget as the first movie. Yeah, I, I assume so. You said there's stuff in the book that, like, makes for a better franchise than than what is in the movie? Yes! Um, could you elaborate? So, we're introduced to our characters here. I, I mentioned before, you know, Annabeth's character in the movie is basically two characters combined into one. Right. And uh, they actually run into the problem immediately. The next book down in Sea of Monsters, the character that movie Annabeth kind of ate and, and included into herself in the movie is the rival group that is trying to go on the second movie's journey to get what uh, Percy and their group are trying to get. So they combine these two characters in the first movie and one of the characters that they squashed into Annabeth, they would literally have needed for the next movie. And so there's a lot of ground laying that you get with Clarice in The Lightning Thief, the book, that gives you a lot of context for her character and makes her character feel a lot more fleshed out in Sea of Monsters. In addition to that, there's also a camp counselor figure that is above uh, Chiron, who does not appear in the Lightning Thief movie. Uh, it's it's Dionysus, isn't yes. it? I remember Dionysus being in the book. Yes, which, sir, not appearing in this movie. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, why would why would you kick out Dionysus of your movie? That just sounds so much fun. <laughs> One of, one of the things I specifically remember from the book is him, like, making himself a glass of wine and then someone, like, getting on to him for being, like, a camp counselor. And he's like, ugh, fine. And then he gets, like, a Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his it, his justification for being there in the, uh, the books is that he's serving community service, essentially, for uh, banging one of his dad's girlfriends. <laughs> and so he's there and all his wine powers have been turned into Diet Coke powers instead of the power of wine. <laughs> yeah. 
But <laughs> the Pierce Brosnan character, Chiron, uh, does not appear in Sea of Monsters uh, because he's been like kicked out for something. And he's the only adult figure that we meet in the Lightning Thief movie. So in Sea of Monsters, not only do they have to introduce this rival figure who is a main character opposite of Percy's group, but they also have to introduce this new authority figure at the camp. And so Sea of Monsters is already, the movie is already off to a huge, you know, bad start because they have to reestablish characters that if they had just adapted the book the way the book was, they'd already have those characters established. Yeah. Yeah. And that was what made me so mad whenever I was 14 years old. (laughs) It's like, I think a TV show is a better idea because it feels like there's so much to adapt and it's like, I can imagine it's like making the Avatar movie, like the last Airbender movie that we've talked about on the show. It, yeah. it, it is something that would stress me out if I was responsible for condensing it into a movie. Mm-hmm. But sometimes there's just decisions that don't make sense. Sometimes there's decisions that are like absolutely going to come back and bite you in the ass. Um, it, it's It's almost like the opposite problem of like the modern trying to start a cinematic universe movie like like the mummy um, yeah. <laughs> which introduces entirely too many <laughs> characters because they're trying to start a franchise uh, rest in peace dark universe uh, <laughs> you had a good run oh uh, don't worry that will be showing up on hollow victory oh, so. no. <laughs> Uh, um, by by then, Payton will be the new co-host. He'll be replacing <laughs> me. <laughs> I, I I made I made Michael watch Rob Schneider movies. Nothing I can do will make him quit. At this point. <laughs> he, he he talks a big game, but if he did, if he sat through Rob Schneider, he's in it for the long haul. I like them more than Showgirls. <laughs> my train of thought <laughs> um well we probably should move on to aragon soon Is well there okay, okay. I, I i did want to talk about uh the director of this movie chris columbus because he is the director of the first two harry potter movies yep director of the first two and yeah. a producer on prisoner of azkaban yeah damn i didn't know that so, you guys may have said that last night but i don't remember well i mean he he's a big director you know he did home alone he did uh oh, i think he was a producer on gremlins right no he was a, he was the writer of gremlins he wrote gremlins right uh he directed the goonies no no he wrote the goonies my bad uh richard donner directed the goonies but he he directed pixels <laughs> <laughs> we talk we talk a big game about like uh actors who come back onto the show we haven't had a director repeat yet, have we? I'm sure it's going to happen eventually, but... Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Because um, even, even I... like, Indiana Jones 4 and Star Wars had different directors. Yeah, and, and uh, fucking the football player wrote one of the Rob Schneider movies and directed the other one. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't direct both. It's just going to come down to whenever we do Shyamalan, the Shyamalan episode. <laughs> Although, actually, uh, no, wait, we've already done Shyamalan, so all we have to we, do is just another we, Shyamalan we movie. Have, yeah, we have <laughs> one Shyamalan under our belt, and I feel like inevitably we're going to come back to that, so... Yeah. All roads lead to Shyamalan. <laughs> oh, there's got to be something you could pair with Glass with, like, a disappointing sequel made years after the first one. Uh, for sure, for sure. Like, almost two... No, uh, oh, yeah, almost two decades. It was 2000, 2019. Um, but it, like... Of, of all of the, like, we really want to be Harry Potter movies, I feel like getting Chris Columbus in to direct this is, like, the most, like, we want to be Harry Potter move you could have yeah. done. And... Um, and he was one of the first people they got on the project. Like, he was brought on in 2007, pretty much as soon as they n- knew that they were going to make this movie. Like, they went to Chris Columbus and they're like, we we need you to direct, please. Well, yeah, I mean, that that it makes sense, you know? Like, okay, we want to grab the Harry Potter crowd 
who do we get? I know, the guy who made the first Harry Potter The guy movie. who started it. Um, yeah. Now, and, and, I mean, there's a lot of similarities between Percy Jackson and Harry Potter. Uh, you know, they're both, like, boys who, who have come from sort of a dysfunctional family and then stumble into, like, this world of mythical creatures. Um... I think part of the advantage Harry Potter has is that it's specifically set at this wizarding school, Mm -hmm. right? So if you can nail the aesthetic of Hogwarts, which they absolutely did, Mm -hmm. you're like halfway to a good Harry Potter movie already. Percy Jackson, on the other hand, it's, it's New York, it's Nashville, it's Vegas, and it's like, okay, these are nice places, but I've seen them in other movies. Right. Done better. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> and to that point, in this movie, the Camp Half Blood space is like nowhere near as as beautiful or as like lived in feeling yeah. as Hogwarts is in the first Harry Potter movie. Yeah, it just looks like they went into the woods of someone's like <laughs> backyard. They just went into the woods and filmed. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a really boring setting, and I remember it being a lot more interesting in the books. Granted. I, I, I guess that was sort of in my own imagination. I had to imagine what the camp looked like myself, but I I seem to recall the, the camp being far more interesting in the book than just this, this like, okay, we're in the woods <laughs> and there's like some cabins. Aragon's not much better with settings, but I feel like the camp at the end is a little bit better. Uh... It, might... Both these movies were pretty boring location-wise, though. There was just woods. Hey, we're gonna go into the woods. I, I might disagree just a little. I think Aragorn, Aragon is better with location. That's what I said. Yeah, Aragon feels like like every time they had a shot of something that was maybe a little bit nondescript, it felt like a commercial for like Hungary. Or Czechoslovakia, where they were filming. <laughs> like, sure, maybe not a yeah, lot is going on uh, right now, but damn, that just looks like such a nice place to be. In Aragon, they I, I like it because they I don't know they just it felt a lot more like a tribe. You know, there was like torches set up, and there was like a cave set in. Mm-hmm. But before we get too deep into this, did we have anything else to say about Percy Jackson? Because if not, I'll just introduce Aragon. Um. It was my. It was entertain bad, but entertaining at first, and by the end of it, I was really glad that it was over. Yeah, it wasn't horrible, but it was incredibly generic. It was. It was exactly what I was expecting it to be. Granted, there was a part of me that was worried it might be even worse than it was. <laughs> but yeah. At, at it, the end of it, it's like okay, that is exactly what i expect (laughs) i'm already not like the biggest like fan of like these types of movies so honestly i was expecting a lot worse and no it wasn't i keep having that though because i was like really thinking that john carter was gonna bore the shit out of me and it didn't i was really expecting this to bore the shit out of me and it did at points but overall i got through it just fine paid in anything else that that pretty much covers it i i I've got a few gripes with changes they made. They shot themselves in the foot a little bit, but very much a solid just five or six out of ten movie. <laughs> I don't know that I would go that high. <laughs> I, I'm, prob- I'm probably in like the four or five mm. range. I would say four is fair. Maybe three, maybe three, four. I'll, get, I'll go four. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, then there was Aragon. Based on, I should have looked up more information about the book <laughs> before I started talking. We're um, not live action by, anymore. You can cut this out. The book by Christopher Paolini. Mm-hmm. Hope I'm saying that right. Uh, released in 2002. Um, it follows Aragon, a young boy who lives in this kingdom that has been overrun by this like evil king. Uh, and the, the, the people can't defend themselves because they used to have these great dragon riders, but the dragon riders have gone extinct. But then, uh, Aragon finds a dragon egg and the dragon hatches and it's, it's discovered that he's a dragon rider and he's the glorious dragon rider who's going to, to free the land. Um, 
That's about it. That's <laughs> that covers it, I think. That's what the movie's about. Aragon Aragon is here to save the day. He's a dragon rider. Uh it's <laughs> I I said to you guys, it's uh it's how to train your dragon, but worse. <laughs> Every scene in this film feels like a filler scene in a better fantasy movie, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, well, like, this is the boring part, but after this, after this, there's a really cool part, <laughs> but there's no really cool part in this movie. It's all the boring part. I, I was gonna say, uh, it, <laughs> this movie bored the shit out of me. God. <laughs> I, I, I didn't care a single scene <laughs> like when we were watching the lightning thief you know we were riffing that whole first part before it kind of fell off at the oh, end. yeah this movie i just remember us starting it and we made some comments about the the effects at the beginning there was like some weird slow down stuff they kept doing aside from yeah. that there was just nothing to riff on because like you said matt it's just like filler it's fantasy filler we just started shouting Bazinga. <laughs> well, okay, there was a spell whose name was very close to Bazinga. <laughs> it's like, like Br- Brzinger? Yeah. He says Brzinger? I think it, like, because of the way they pronounced it, though, it sounded like they were saying Brzinga, you know, like, it wasn't, it didn't even yeah. sound like er at the end, it was like, you heard the uh, and that really made it sound like Brzinga. <laughs> Bazinga with an R. Brzinga. <laughs> I think this movie does a couple of things better than Percy Jackson, as we mentioned, like sets, but in terms of like how yeah. entertaining it is, oh, Percy Jackson has it beaten on entertainment levels. <laughs> I I think uh, where Percy Jackson, I think, was very much trying to uh, cash in on Harry Potter, this feels a little more like it was trying to cash in on Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Granted, maybe some of that has to do with uh, the source material, because it feels like the source material is a little Lord of the Ringsy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, e- even, like, I keep kept calling the main character Aragorn instead of Aragon. <laughs> Uh, even though his name is Dragon, except the D is replaced with an E. <laughs> even as a kid, that stood out to me. <laughs> Yeah. Because the first time I saw it, I'm like, dragon? Wait, that's an E. (laughs) Aragon? I thought Aragon was the dragon up till this point. (laughs) The the story suffers a little bit because Christopher Paolini was 15 years old when he started writing this book. So if it sounds kind of like a kid just kind of regurgitating ideas they got from all their favorite fantasy novels... It was a kid regurgitating ideas they got from all their favorite fantasy <laughs> novels. Okay, uh, that checks out, I guess. <laughs> Truth be told, I think that there's some like concepts in this that could be entertaining with good characters. And I actually think that there's one character in this movie that I kind of liked, but the issue was I didn't think he bounced off anyone well, because mm. I didn't like any of the other characters. And that was Jeremy Irons' character. Now, to be fair, I might just be getting manipulated by Jeremy Irons' voice. I swear to God, he's just a fun actor to listen to. Uh, His voice is, like, very unique and no one else sounds like him. But I felt like there was kind of an arc for his character. And I just kind of wish, like, they're trying to imply that he had this really deep and personal connection to the main character by the end of it that they really grew. But I don't think the film showed that very well. I felt most of the time they just seemed like they didn't care for one another. But there'd be a scene where they laughed, like, maybe once, you know? Yeah, it really feels like they caged a lot of their good ideas with Braum, kind of stuck in there with him. Like you said, just because he didn't bounce off people. I made a note about how they do a really cool thing where, you know, in in the time where all the dragon riders get destroyed, uh, Braum is fighting on the side of against the king and opposite him is like the right hand to the king who is also a dragon rider who had the last living dragon aside from the kings in the fight and they make it so that Braum was actually the one that killed the last dragon and last dragon rider aside from the king so there's a lot of cool minutia they're trying to pull out with Braum, but it just he doesn't have any walls to throw the spaghetti against 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, honestly, I'm glad we had a lot to say about Percy Jackson, because I have very little to say about Eric. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I don't like the characters. I didn't think that uh, Aragon and what's the dragon's name again? Sephora? Zef- it sounds like Sephora, <laughs> that freaking Jumanji sequel. <laughs> Sephora, yes. Um, sh- She will, I, I, you know, I, it's a cool character. It's cool that they can speak to each other in their own like heads like that, but it's like they don't have anything interesting to say to one another. <laughs> They're not, and I'm sure the book writes them better, but I'm sure that they these characters are stuck for a reason, but it's not done well here. It took me a while to realize that only Aragon could hear the dragon. <laughs> Now that's just me being stupid. I, I'm sure I did question made that clearer, but I did actually question if he could hear her. I, I did come to the same conclusion, but I was like, "Can he hear her?" I think the scene where I finally realized that he couldn't was the one where uh, he was like, "Are you even listening to me?" <laughs> uh, because it's like, "Oh, okay, he do- he can't hear her because otherwise he wouldn't have said that." But I don't think that they really fully established that he can't hear her. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, Jeremy Irons can't hear her. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jeremy Irons being in this movie just sort of reminds me of the Dungeons and Dragons movie. <laughs> uh, granted, in that, he's the villain, but he also has, like, a big deal with dragons in that movie. So, um, we could talk about some of the other actors in this movie besides Mr. Irons, uh, because the main villain is played by John Malkovich. <laughs> And you know what? I I don't even think he's... I think he would be the main villain of the whole series. I think the actual main villain would be that other guy who dies at the end of this movie. Gets his heart impaled. Yeah. Where John Malkovich kind of feels like they're setting him up for a later movie. You know, he's only in a little bit of this one. Yeah, uh, John Malkovich is the glob glob gab glab. <laughs> oh, shit. IMDb just crashed on me. <laughs> I was about I was about to read his name actually, and then it's like nope. Uh, Galbatro Galbatrix Gal Galbatroy Galbatrix. Galbatrix. Yeah, something like that. I remember it sounded like a name I would come up with. <laughs> um, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I don't think John Malkovich is that good of an actor. I think he's in some good stuff. I think he is in some movies that use him right. But I think free of, like, good direction, he is not naturally a good actor. I like him in two movies that I can think of, which is Burn After Reading and Being John Malkovich. (laughs) I would throw Con Air in there. Haven't seen it. I thought he was, like, really bad in that new Steve Carell show, though I only watched, like, two episodes of it. In Con Air, he's like this crazy villain character, <laughs> which I guess he kind of is supposed to be in this movie too. But he works so much better in Con Air. In this, he feels he like so much of his performance just falls flat. I suffer without my stone. Do not prolong my <laughs> suffering. <laughs> yeah. First words we hear like out of he, his mouth. Honestly, if he like it, it feels like he's trying to downplay this character he's he's trying to go more like regal with it more subdued but it's like no you're john malkovich and you're playing the evil king go crazy (laughs) um this movie has uh after jeremy irons die because he dies uh there's like a new person who joins them which it feels like they're doing (laughs) this a little too late (laughs) Yeah, no, all of these characters just come out of nowhere right before the yeah. third act. <laughs> and there's like a betrayal scene after you meet a character five minutes ago. It's like <laughs> he, the, his dad is this bad guy. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's like you knew him for five seconds. So don't... <laughs> this isn't a good twist. We don't know him yet. You just introduced... I think he appeared earlier in the movie very briefly. But, uh... Yeah, he he really he was just being introduced to us now, and his introduction was he was like in the bushes, you know, yes. like he wasn't. <laughs> he, he's like skulking he's around. Like, he's got a hood up. He's got like emo black hair, and then like five minutes after he joins the prop the the party proper, like 
we find out, oh, his dad's a bad guy. Oh, really? <laughs> Who could have guessed? <laughs> this this feels like something that a game like Undertale or Deltarune would do as a joke. Like they throw a character in who joins your party for five minutes and gets kicked out. You know, it seems like something that would be done as a joke in something like this. Uh, and, and I'm sure this is a symptom of adapting a very long book. I'm sure, sure. he had much more development in the book. Uh, Payton, confirm. If I, I don't know how familiar you are with Aragon. Ad- admittedly, I only read the book. When it came out, I, w- I was really into it when it came out, but I just read the one book when it came out. I believe I... that the character that we're riffing on right now, Murtog, I think he turns out to be another dragon rider later in like the second or third book. But mm. this is all he does in the first story. And like you said, we've truncated a lot of the story. So he skulks around a little bit he joins the party and then five minutes later we throw him in jail until halfway through the final battle (laughs) yeah um there is i want to mention the other hall of victories actor really Uh, quickly but i i'll I'll say his name it's yeah but jaimon hunsu i looked up how to pronounce it he was also he was in serenity yes uh, he he ran the boat with Matthew McConaughey. Um, also in Shazam, also in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, good actor. Yeah, for sure. I uh... he's he's not in much of this movie. <laughs> no, he like isn't. He sh- and you get the idea that he'd be a what? big part of maybe the sequel, but yeah, it's it's weird because he he seems to be like the person leading the charge into this final battle, and it's like. We met you, we met you like three minutes ago. <laughs> like we talk about Percy Jackson being like like this didn't need to be two hours. Aragon feels rushed a little bit. Like it could have stood to be longer. Granted, you probably also could have cut down on like the first hour of the movie and had more time for these characters near the end. But I don't yeah. know. It it feels like. If this had gone on another 20 minutes, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I did have one uh, other thing I just want to say about a character. Then there's like, it kind of feels like it's doing the same thing that Percy Jackson does. When then it's like, uh, you have the bland main character, Aragon. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) And then you have the bland girl. Granted, the girl in Percy Jackson's actually like involved in the story for most of it. But, uh... (laughs) In this the one, girl in the, the girl in this does nothing. <laughs> she does absolutely nothing, and I mean, at least like you know, Percy Jackson had some, <laughs> had some interest in female characters <laughs> aside from that. But this one's just like, no, it's just her, and she's in it for five minutes. Yeah, like Percy Jackson has some like interesting side characters. I think the only character in this movie I cared that much about was Jeremy Irons. I, I guess, I guess the dra- I keep forgetting about the dragon. Which well, is the, weird. the dragon, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, but it's Rachel weird Weiss. that I keep forgetting about her, right? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> <laughs> she is such a boring character too, and it feels like they're trying with her. It feels like they try to give her like a little bit of wit. It feels like they try to make her Karen, but also kind of a hard ass at times, you know, like trying to tell him like sometimes you have to make a tough decision, but it's just, it doesn't work. I, I do not believe their dynamic at all in the movie. Uh, Rachel Wise is a good actress. Great actress. You know? <laughs> and I mean, she, she's, I, I think she works as the dragon. She's got a very eloquent voice. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's the right in. Yeah, she does not have a lot to do. Yeah, that's my big kind of thing just across the entire movie is I feel like they do a really good job of making it look beautiful, making it look like a fantasy world and making it seem like kind of a neat place to be in. I just don't want to watch this story in this universe. (laughs) I'm just not interested in watching Aragon's story. That is absolutely fair. Yeah. Do we have anything else to say about Aragon? Um, I do. Um, visually, this one is not very good. Occasionally, it gets a good shot in there, but I just, 
I disagree a little bit because we were talking about how this feels like a, a Lord of the Rings, uh. like tr- trying to cash in on the Lord of the Rings, and I think they have a lot of those like big sprawling shots like Lord of the Rings has of like, ah, oh, look at all this beautiful scenery. Granted, the action is not very good, but I didn't think the action was very good in Percy Jackson either. Yeah, I don't. I agree that it doesn't look great in Percy Jackson, although I don't think it looks as bad as this one. I think that um, this one definitely has nice shots in it. And when it comes to just filming something pretty generic, like characters walk in, you know, it's not it's not fucking up literally every shot in the film. But at the <laughs> beginning, I mentioned they like. They have, like, a scene that looks like it was shot at night, and then they put, like, a glowing effect on the screen. Oh, yeah. It looked, well, like, it looked horrible. And that's not the only part, though. Then there's, like, the scene where he's right in the dragon, and he's, like, the colors are changing. It's, like, yeah, it's, it looks it's horrible. It's supposed to be, like, dragon sight. Oh, yeah. Oh. But it's not It's not a very good effect. It looks awful, I think. And then even during, like, a lot of the flying scenes, it just does these, like, really weird cuts, and we're constantly zoomed in on the eyes, and... <laughs> I, I don't think this movie yeah. looks that good at all. Granted, there are some shots that I really... I like this. I like the shot a lot. I mentioned this one specifically. The shot right after Brom died. They have the shot on the mountain where the dragon kind of lifts her, her wings up and like the camera's pan and you have this giant crystal. Well, that, like, that's a shot that actually looks really nice in my opinion. Um, so it definitely has like... A, they definitely had a good eye for it at times. And other times it's just, oh, I, I thought it didn't work. <laughs> I did think of something I wanted to bring up with Percy Jackson that I forgot to mention. Oh, go ahead. Which is the the beginning where they have, there's like a cow in the middle of the road <laughs> and they like swerve to miss it. And then the car like flips over <laughs> for no reason. It's a fucking Blues Brothers physics. <laughs> like the car just flips out of nowhere. It was the vibration from that cow drop. <laughs> Yeah, I agree that the action scenes in Percy Jackson were nothing to, like, write home about, but I definitely didn't, like, they didn't strike me as nearly as bad as the ones. Here's the thing, I don't think either of these movies look horrible, but I think they look very nothing, they're very unnoteworthy. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, well, that was an action scene. (laughs) <laughs> I think at its worst, Percy Jackson is generic, and I think at Aragon's worst, it's, like, pretty bad. Again, not ev- not literally every single scene and every single shot is bad, but I think it gets pretty bad at points. <laughs> maybe that's just me, but maybe people would disagree with me. I don't know how... I don't know what to say about the CG on the dragon, because I don't remember what other movies looked like at the time. Like, yeah, it doesn't look real, but at the same time, it was 2006, so... I mean, uh, it would have been after Lord of the Rings, mm, yeah. But maybe, maybe that's too high a bar. Lord of the Rings had really good CG for the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, this did come out the year after Goblet of Fire, Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. So we did have a pretty nice litmus test of dragons. And those feel like, I feel like they hold up a little bit. So this one kind of lags behind a little. It's not like terrible for yeah. the time, I don't think. But Yeah, it's, it's passable for the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. If it came out this year, it'd be kind of believable for yeah. it to come out this year when you have stuff like Artemis Fowl, though. <laughs> like, I, I could believe it. <laughs> All right, give me just a second. I'm looking at movies that came out in 2006 um king kong uh (laughs) peter jackson's king kong oh uh pirates of the caribbean dead man's chest oh that one looked pretty good that had some pretty good cg in it actually yeah yeah the main villain looked pretty damn good in that movie Uh, that's disney money but (laughs) man i feel like we've said this Um, before on this show or at least somewhere else. <laughs> I know Water Horse. I don't. I don't know if y'all remember that one. That one came out in two thousand seven. Do. Yeah. All right. So the dragon passable for the time. Not not like high end CG, but acceptable CG. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if you guys got nothing else, are we ready to move on to voting? Yeah. Bring it. All right. Uh. Peyton, you're our guest. I'll let you go first. As much as it pains me to say it, 
I I think I'm going to place my vote for Percy Jackson <laughs> as as the better movie. All right. All right. Um I'll be honest, I went into this episode a little on the fence, and I think I was even leaning Aragon. I think Aragon kind of commits a little better than Percy Jackson does, but at the same time, I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, nah, Percy Jackson held my attention way better than Aragon did. I, I spaced out a few times in Aragon, but Percy Jackson, you know, it had its boring moments, but I was paying attention the whole time. So, yeah, I think I, too, am going to have to pick Percy Jackson. I think you make uh, a... Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say, I think I know which way you're going. Uh, honest to God, though, going off of what you said, I, I understand your point there a lot, because even, like, as we were getting to the cl- end of Aragon, I was still thinking about it, even though I knew I liked yeah. Percy Jackson more, because I do try to be... I try to be objective with this. On my on my letterbox rank, and I go with how I, object, how I subjectively feel about a movie... And that's why some of the movies that have, like, wa- uh, have lost are higher than some of the ones that won. But, uh, um, this is one of those ones where I was, it's kind of like Tank Girl and Barbed Wire, where I was really struggling. There was the movie that I was entertained by more, and then there was the movie that kind of felt like it understood itself better. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think I'm going to say Percy Jackson, just because I think it looked nicer, and I think it actually had some character, like, it had multiple characters that I kind of thought were at least interesting, like, not just so one note. I mean, kind of one note, but not bland, where Aragon, there was, like, one character, and even him, like, it's not, he's not, like, an amazing character. It's just the closest thing to a good character. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a better made movie, and I don't know if I would say it's a better written movie, because it's a little all over, all over the place, but it's certainly more endearing. Yeah. So Percy no. Jackson. I, there, there, there are certainly things I think Aragon does better than Percy Jackson. But if you ask me which one of these I wanted to watch a second time, I'd probably watch Percy Jackson a second time over Aragon. Before you announce the audience vote, it's it's you know, I mean, I don't know if it's unanimous, but it's like Percy Jackson absolutely won. But I didn't check the votes, but I did check the comments on the last poll. <laughs> If we're Percy Jackson versus Aragon, and the two comments there just both said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I almost always get a no comment when I put these <laughs> polls up. Always from different people. Like I I, I went back and double checked. I'm like, nope, it's always a different person just saying no. <laughs> but uh, this one got more no's than any of the others. <laughs> it's not the worst pair up we've done. It's I think it's what I think this one is right down the middle. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think this one was pretty close. Um, but with 22 votes, Percy Jackson took it with 68% versus <laughs> Aragon's 32%. So it was basically uh, one-third to two-thirds vote there. All right. So Percy Jackson and the Olympians, the Lightning Thief wins. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> You hate to see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eh. I mean, one of them had to is the problem. <laughs> that is that is the eternal struggle of this. Because sh- if, if Percy Jackson didn't win, then Aragon would win. <laughs> hey, 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 Matt. Yeah. I don't know what you're planning on doing next, but I just want to remind you that these last three uh, months have been miserable experiences. Don't worry, don't worry. I've got a fun one. So, uh, next episode, we're celebrating one year of Hollow Victories. I think it was actually supposed to be this episode, and I fucked up the schedule. But uh, ignore that. Time is relative. Next episode is the one year anniversary. And since our first episode was the fourth movie in a series about a DC comic character and a female-centric spinoff, I figured we could do another fourth movie in a series about a DC comic character versus a female-centric spinoff. It's Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, versus Supergirl. Hey. <laughs> um, Peyton, do you want people to find you? <laughs> do you have anything you want to plug? Um, 
don't <laughs> don't find me yet. Don't look for me. <laughs> if <laughs> you can find me at nowhere, don't. <laughs> um, in in all uh, seriousness, I do have uh, I have a band camp. I don't know if it's I don't know if I'm actually going to be able to upload anything onto that that's worth anything in the next few years. But if you want to go to PaytonTaylorMusic.BandCamp.com. That's me. You have a single video about uh, Elsa's progression to the cathedral. Yes, I do have a YouTube channel that I uploaded one video to three years ago. So if you are a band kid and you have fond memories of Elsa's procession to the cathedral and you want to look behind how we got to the point of playing that piece in band that is a slice of an opera... Uh, go check it out. The audio quality is absolutely terrible. I knew even less about what I was doing three years ago than I do now. <laughs> but hey, if if you're a band kid and you want to revel in that joy with me, please, by all means. And, and it features some horrible Franz Liszt slander. <laughs> I love me some Liszt. I will fight Franz Liszt if he ever comes back to life. <laughs> <laughs> uh i gotta show you lit's litstomania that's a great movie i love that movie <laughs> fucking uh the lead singer of the who plays franz list Ooh, okay that checks out and 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 ringo star plays the pope <laughs> that also checks out <laughs> um but yeah that's me at have tuba will travel is the YouTube channel. If you find it with one video, that's me. All right. Uh, Michael, anything else to say? Uh, no. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming for on, Michael. Payton. Thank you for having <laughs> yes, thank me. You. Thank you for joining us, Payton. Thank you for your insight about these uh, novels that these movies are based on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Percy Jackson stands are like the theater kids of high school book, <laughs> book nerds we're always welcome to share our trauma with the world uh for my co-host movie mackle i'm matt presents see you in the next one peace